This video will explain momentum predictive representations, the latest advancement in data efficient reinforcement learning, particularly when doing control from visual inputs. In this slide, we'll get a quick overview of the momentum predictive representation learning algorithm before contrasting it to this progression of self-supervised contrastive learning algorithms, as well as how auxiliary tasks have been used for representation learning and reinforcement learning, particularly in the curl paper that also has an auxiliary uh, contrastive learning loss to better formulate that representation from high dimensional image that you get as input in a visual control task like uh, DeepMind Control Suite or the Atari games or a robot that say makes a salad. So we have this auxiliary loss that's going to facilitate the mapping from high dimensional images into a semantic representation that facilitates something like either a cue learning where you have this value estimate of a state action pair or a direct policy mapping from this Z vector into an action to take. So in this framework, we're using contrastive learning to improve our representation. And the way that contrastive learning is set up in this framework is to do it temporally, which makes a lot of sense for these reinforcement learning tasks. So a lot of these previous contrastive learning algorithms like SimCLR, uh, MoCo, or uh, the contrastive clustering technique, they take an image and then apply two different data augmentation transformations to it. And that forms two views of the same image. So they're maximizing the similarity between these two views and then making it dissimilar from the other images in a mini batch or queue, or recently in papers like Bootstrap Your Own Latent, they don't even bother with the negative queue. So that's the high level idea is that they're augmenting these two images and then making those views similar to each other compared to this temporal consistency where you want to make the image at, say, frame t minus one consistent with t and t plus one, which makes kind of a lot more sense for these visual uh, control tasks. So the way that this is done is by first having the online encoder map the high dimensional image into a lower dimensional tensor, in this case a 64 by 7 by 7 uh, feature tensor that is then mapped into a prediction of the future. So this isn't directly a predict into the future kind of loss as in a lot of these uh, like latent space transition or model based reinforcement learning algorithms that would directly uh, penalize this mapping based on how accurately it's predicted into the future. Rather the loss function comes from the cosine similarity which is the uh, dot product of these two uh, predictions divided by the normalized score of them. And they so they're using the similarity losses in contrast of learning with a running average of the weights of the same neural network. And they also use data augmentation on the image frames to have an even more robust representation. So now we'll get into more of the details and kind of the history of these learning algorithms. Before getting into self-supervised learning particularly, and approaches to use self-supervised representation learning alongside reinforcement learning for visual control, let's motivate this idea of data efficient reinforcement learning. So algorithms like Mu0 and Agent57 use 10 to 50 years of experience per Atari game. And the OpenAI 5, the Dota 2 algorithm, uses 45,000 years of experience. So this is obviously undesirable for real world robots where we would want them to be able to interact with the environment and learn. We don't want to have to build these perfect simulators or solve the sim to real problem. So we'd like to have more data efficient reinforced learning algorithms if it's possible and at least uh, motivate a lot of interest in research. So the emergent benchmark for exploring this data efficient deep reinforced learning uh, papers has been this Atari 100K where you are allowed 100,000 steps in this Atari game to master it, and it's equivalent to about two hours of real-time experience. These are some of the most promising directions towards data-efficient reinforcement learning. In this video, we're looking at an auxiliary self-supervised learning algorithm. In addition to learning the mapping from high-dimensional states into actions or state action pairs as in value-based reinforcement learning, we are doing an auxiliary self-supervised learning task. So we have these two loss functions, it's multitask learning, where we're learning a mapping into the Q-learning loss, as well as this contrastive uh, consistency loss. So another approach is model-based reinforcement learning. And model-based reinforcement learning is where the agents can uh, predict the environment themselves. They can predict this dynamics model where they have a sense of what the state action transition into the next state and reward is gonna be. So this is this predicting into the future idea. And you can do this by completely reconstructing the pixel space, as in this paper, World Models from David Ha and Jürgen Schmidhuber, that has this variational autoencoder for predicting into the future, so you completely reconstruct the frame. And that is interesting, but it's also a bit intractable. So more recent models like uh, Planet and Dreamer, they predict the future, but in this latent space. So even though momentum predictive representations 
is predicting the future with this temporal consistency. It's not being, uh, the loss function isn't about having this exact prediction of the future or using this prediction of the future to facilitate with planning or something like that. It's rather being used with this consistency with a running average of the same neural network. So there's a really great tutorial of recent advancements in model-based reinforced learning linked to in the description of this video from the ICML 2020 conference. So another interesting approach that is kind of an even bigger scope than just data-efficient reinforcement learning is offline or batch reinforcement learning. And this is where we have a, a massive collection of past experiences, but because it isn't uh, on policy, it's not what the agent would currently want to do with the mapping from the state to action, you have to do this kind of important sampling and alignment to make use of this uh, previously collected data that isn't exactly aligned with the model's current representation of the world. But it's another interesting approach that is has leaders like Sergey Levine uh, dedicating a lot of interest and effort towards. So now we'll go through a quick timeline of works leading up to momentum predictive representations. So the momentum part is inspired by this paper, Momentum Contrastive Learning, which has shown huge gains in self-supervised contrastive learning in this kind of representation learning framework. So what they showed is that instead of having this end-to-end -end where you have the same encoder network copied twice. So you have two copies of the online network that encode the positive and negative examples. You can use a momentum encoder of the negative examples, and then you store the most recently encoded negative examples in this dictionary or queue. So the most recently encoded samples go on the top of the queue, and it's a finite length queue, so that bumps out the oldest encoded examples. And then you sample from this queue to do the negative comparison loss. So the key idea here in this momentum encoder is that this momentum encoder part of the network is not updated with gradient descent. The gradients go left through this network and through the online encoder, and the momentum encoder is updated by taking a uh, moving average of the encoder neural network's parameters. So it has this running average plus the uh, latest update of the encoder, and this is the key idea behind having this online network that predicts this kind of uh, consistent target with the past versions of itself measured by averaging out the weights. Bootstrap Your Own Latent takes us to a pretty extreme point and it's very surprising that this works so well. So you have the input image and we do this thing where we have the two data augmentations that form the new views of the same image. So this could be the same image uh, rotated 15 degrees or the same image rotated negative 30 degrees translated for pixels and uh, the red histogram has been updated or something like that. So you have these two views of the same image this one goes through the online network F sub theta, and this one is F sub uh, encoder, where it's the exponential moving average of this network. And so the idea is that instead of just having the online network try to make its prediction of these two views similar, it also has to make it consistent with this target neural network. And the target neural network has this stop gradient operation. The gradients don't go back through the momentum encoder. The momentum encoder target network is updated as the running average of the gradients that go through the top online network. So momentum contrastive learning and bootstrap your own latent are two ways of, of setting up this contrastive learning framework and the details of how we're implementing the positive negative or the online target network comparison. CURL, Contrastive Unsupervised Representations for Reinforcement Learning, was one of the first papers to simultaneously do this policy mapping from high dimensional observation, an image or a stack of images into this uh, representation it could be uh, into a Q function or it could be right into a policy or right into a value of the state. And so you do this auxiliary contrast of learning loss. So one of the key differences between momentum predictive representations, the subject of this video, and curl is that here you're using the two augmented views of the same image that have been augmented compared to this temporal consistency with respect to predicting T plus one, T plus two, T plus three. So to further communicate this idea, I think this temporal contrastive loss is a really interesting part of this momentum predictive representation learning algorithm. So on Wednesday, I released a video looking at this uh, contrastive clustering paper. And again, so this is this idea illustrated well of taking an image and then forming two views of it by augmenting it with, uh, you know, some kind of color zoom in thing and then a massive zoom in and like a grayscale transformation and comparing these two views compared to interacting with an environment with a reinforced learning agent and then using this temporal consistency between step one, step two, step three, where we expect this kind of you know, semantics to have some sense in the future of, say, doing deep mind control or even the open AI gym, like the cart pole balancing or bipedal walking, you can easily imagine why this temporal consistency 
for setting up the positive pairs for contrast of learning seems to make a lot of sense. So one last time, we'll walk through the algorithm of momentum predictive representations. So we start off with the parameters of our online encoder network, F sub O, and the projection head G sub O as theta sub O. So similar to the SimCLR paper, we're gonna have this separate multi-layer perceptron projection from F into G to take on the uh, loss function. So we have our feature extraction network and then a projection from that to get the different loss function. So then we also have our target encoder, F sub M, and projection head G sub M. These are both the running averages of this online neural network's parameters. So then we have the parameters of our transition model H and our predictor Q and Q learning head. So this is our mapping from this Z into this transition model. And then we have the projection head G sub O into the prediction of Y prime T plus K comparing to uh, this other Y hat T plus K, which is our uh, moving average of the same network. And then we also have the Q learning head that also has parameters mapping this Z into the Q learning loss function and doing the Q learning task. So then we have the maximum prediction depth is K. So we're doing this temporal consistency. We're prediction, predicting steps one up to K. So if K is five, we predict T plus one, T plus two, up to T plus five. And this is a hyperparameter of the algorithm. You could play around with how much you want to do the prediction depth. So then we have our replay buffer, which is where we're sampling the experience from. So while we're training, we're going to interact with the environment, collecting these state action and then the environment's response and reward in the next state with the parameters of our online network and our Q learning head. And then we append these transitions into the buffer B that we're gonna be using to sample for our predictions into the future. So now we're sampling the mini badge from the replay buffer. And if we're using data augmentation, then we're going to uh, augment these images to have the consistency with the data augmentation views of the transitions as well. So then we uh, enter this loop where we're going to be encoding the original Z sub zero and then predicting Z1, Z2, Z3, and making it consistent with our Z prime of K from the online encoder, as well as the uh, momentum and encoded moving average, the G sub M of the same representation. So Z K hat is the H, the transition model of the Z vector that comes out of this, as well as the action for learning this transition, because you need to have the action taken to predict the representation in the future as well. So then we have the dot product similarity, the dot product of y hat and the moving average y over the normalized scores of each of the vectors. Then we have the loss combining the contrastive loss with the Q learning loss. And then we update the online network's parameters with the gradient update. And we update the moving average network with the moving average of the online network. The authors also describe some ablations of the study, such as the importance of using this momentum encoder for the other temporal view, compared to say having two copies of the same online network, or another way of setting up the encoder network's parameters like a different way of doing the momentum averaging. Then they look at making better use of data augmentation compared to frameworks like curl, that this importance of this temporal modeling with the dynamics modeling, and then in comparison with other contrast of losses, compared to just using this, uh, the cosine similarity loss for the contrast of learning similarity. The authors hint at a really interesting future work for momentum predictive representations, which is to use this dynamics model for Monte Carlo tree search planning, similar to what's done in mu zero. So in mu zero, we also have this latent space dynamics model where we can predict transitions from state action pairs into the next state. And then we can use this to do planning with a Monte Carlo tree search. And a Monte Carlo tree search would be where we uh, like roll out several different simulations of expanding this latent space uh, future prediction tree. And then we'll look at the leaf nodes to see the value estimates of these leaf nodes. And that sim planning into the future with the expanding the tree gives you a better estimate of which step to take in the immediate future. So they describe that even though this latent dynamics model uh, learned in this framework isn't exactly from uh, predicting the future accurately, rather it's from being consistent, you still might be able to use it for this kind of Monte Carlo tree search planning. And that's a really interesting idea because this planning would definitely improve the uh, algorithm. Thanks for watching this overview of momentum predictive representations. Hopefully from this video, you're able to get a sense of how this algorithm works, how it uses the auxiliary self-supervised learning algorithm with this temporally consistent contrastive learning loss and a moving average target of the same encoder network to learn these representations that facilitate reinforcement learning. I hope from this video, you also got a sense of the motivations behind data efficient reinforced learning, some of the dominant paradigms like this kind of auxiliary self-supervised learning or model-based or offline reinforced learning and how this algorithm connects with a lot of this research 
around contrastive self-supervised learning like Bootstrap Your Own Latent or Momentum Contrastive Learning. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos. Mm -hmm.